Hello from the National Arts Club in New York. I'm Susan Sarandon. Welcome to Mythos. In the previous two programs, Joseph Campbell explored legends that he felt marked the birth of the modern Western consciousness, with its focus on the individual, on the quest for personal enlightenment, and on the romantic ideal of love before duty. This emphasis on individualism took root and flourished in Europe through the centuries of the Renaissance and the Age of Reason, spreading to the New World, where people embraced as their highest ideal the fundamental rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In this talk, Joe continues his examination of the modern West's mythic tradition by looking at the ideas of a group of 18th and 19th century thinkers whose work began to introduce into Western thought some of the great insights of the Asian traditions, the German Romantic philosophers. In 1936, uh, it was a very amusing occasion. Thomas Mann was invited to give the talk at the party in honor of Freud's 80th birthday. Now, how anyone could have thought that an artist could talk about anyone but himself, I can't imagine. <laughs> and uh, it was amusing. Thomas Mann started by saying he didn't understand why he had been invited to do this, because he was an artist, a uh, creator, and not a scientist, not an analyst. He was the object of scientific inquiry, and not the subject. Now, the paper that uh, was published of this talk. It's called Freud and the Future. As I say, it had almost nothing to do with Freud. Mm -hmm. Mann begins by saying that uh, the real achievement of Freud was that he had, through his own researches, reproduced in medical terms all the findings of the German Romantic philosophers of the 19th century, even though Freud had never read any of these. He did not know Schopenhauer, says Bonn. He did not know Nietzsche. He did not know Kierkegaard. And uh, out of his ignorance on his own uh, boat, you know, he had reproduced the whole thing. Then he said, now, if you will pardon me for talking about myself, um, I will show that uh, in my works, long before I heard of Freud, I was already <laughs> working in this mode. <clears throat> and he then spoke of his early short story, Der kleine Herr Friedmann, Little Mr. Friedmann. And uh, this was published in 1896 uh, or 7. That's uh, four or three years before Freud of interpretation of dreams. And it's a fact that in that little story, you get a good deal of uh, Freudian uh, information, or the information that Freud then produced also in other language, and uh, with a totally different slant. About halfway through the lecture, Mann mentioned the unutterable name, namely of Jung and uh, how Jung was inspiring the work that he was doing now, which was his uh, Joseph novels. He had just finished volume three. I can't imagine what went on in that room <laughs> while, while, while he was doing this. <laughs> now, I, I bring this up uh, because it is a, a very good lead into the, the whole context of what was going on in the realm of uh, unconscious research, you might say, uh, in the first uh, half of this century. This was a wonderful period in the arts. I'm going later to be talking about Joyce. And uh, Joyce and Mann, completely ignorant of each other, went through simultaneously a transition in their novels, in their writing, 
from what might be called 19th century naturalism uh, through the psychological accent given in their works to a breakthrough into myth. The First World War comes along, and uh, immediately after it, these two epochal books appear, Joyce's Ulysses, 1922, and Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, 1924. And both of these pretended, so to say, to be naturalistic works, but they were structured on a mythological base. And the mythological structure was given to you in a clue in the title, Ulysses and the Magic Mountain. Then they slide right into the whole sea of myth in their next great works, Thomas Mann's Joseph novels and uh, Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. And they came out, well, Finnegan's Wake came out around 19, it did come out, 1939. And Mann had already started his uh, Joseph novels at that time. It took him a long time. The thing built up for Mann as uh, he went uh, into the material. Now, interesting in contrast is that uh, Joyce was a Catholic, Irish Catholic, and Thomas Mann had been brought up a German Protestant. Now, a Catholic is brought up in a mythological ambience. You, insofar as you take the religion seriously, you're living in immediate relationship to myth. And, of course, the problem then is to relate your experiences when you move into the world to this mythological ground to see the world in terms of those uh, structures which have been put in you in the beginning. Thomas Mann comes the other way around. Uh, one of the characteristics of Protestantism, I would say, is that it rejects the ritual and mythological uh, interpretation and accent in the religion. And uh, so Mann comes gradually into a realization of the mythological depths and what they implied and all. This gave Joyce a kind of um, advantage there that he was a professional in mythological thinking right from infancy. <laughs> and and Mann comes gradually into it. And this makes the two of them an extraordinarily interesting pair to, to uh, bring together. Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain uh, is a work in which Mann is continually explaining the implication of his mythology. He gives you the image, and then there's an a interpretation that's given you one way or another. Joyce does nothing of the kind. Joyce just gives it to you, bing, like that, and uh, you've got to work into it. So I have always found in my own reading and, and thinking about these matters that these two men uh, supplement each other in, a, in an extraordinarily interesting way, and also in their approach to art. Now, in their backgrounds, and this is what I uh, want to uh, talk about uh, this morning, at any rate, are the German philosophers of the 19th century. A very important influence in the years of their growing up was, of course, Wagner. And uh, here was a man who was operating in the field of myth with virtuosic power. Back of that, uh, we come to the philosophers that influenced the two of them. Now, the philosopher that uh, influenced Wagner the most was Schopenhauer. As Nietzsche says at one point, Brunhilde, between Acts 1 and 2, goes out and reads the world as will and idea and comes <laughs> back and sings it. <laughs> and uh, when you uh, read Wagner's autobiography, he tells you that the great crisis was reading of Schopenhauer's world as will and idea. And he said, from then on, I had it at my side all the time. Now, uh, what I should talk about, therefore, is uh, Schopenhauer's world as will and idea. But when you pick up Schopenhauer's world as will and idea, 
uh, which came, uh, was uh, already formed in his mind by about 1818, uh, you realize <laughs> I can't understand this until I've read Kant. So then you have to go back another notch to uh, Immanuel Kant. And uh, this is not so easy. Uh, Schopenhauer says of Kant, Kant is distinguished by eine glänzende Trockenheit, a brilliant dryness. Uh, but what he says isn't so difficult. It's simply the approach that he takes to the saying of it. <coughs> when uh, the moon shot before the one with uh, Armstrong in it, who came down onto the moon, uh, when that module was coming back from going around the moon, uh, Houston, the ground control, said, and I remember hearing this on the TV, uh, who is uh, navigating now? And the answer that came back was Newton. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that hit me hard. I, th I thought, this is terrific. And I immediately thought of Kant's uh, essay on a prolegomena to any metaphysic whatsoever, where Kant asks, how is it that we can make mathematical calculations in this space and know with apodictic certainty that those calculations will hold in another space? Now there were those chaps out there around the moon where nobody had ever been before, and it was known exactly how much energy had to be expelled from the jets and at what angle to bring them down within a mile of a battleship in the Pacific Ocean. This was known before they got there. The characteristics of space, no matter where, are known. They're the characteristics of our own mind. They're known before the experience, and so they're called prior knowledge, a priori knowledge. On the other hand, when Armstrong's foot came down on the moon, no, I remember, you can remember seeing that, no one knew how far his boot was going to go into moon dust. That is a posteriori knowledge. That's the kind of knowledge you get after the experience. How is it that calculations with respect to time and space can be made with apodictic certainty for times and spaces that you have not yet uh, visited. It's because these forms are in the mind. And these are what Kant discusses in that first section of the Critique of Pure Reason, which is called Transcendental Aesthetic. And by the word aesthetic, he means having to do with the sense experience. Aesthetic means having to do with the senses. All of our experiences take place within a field of time and space. And they take place within that field because that is the field of our mentality. This is the realm of phenomenality, phenomena, the objects. We are all in space and time, extending in space and during in time. Now, if there were no space, we wouldn't be separate from each other. If there were no time, we wouldn't be separate from the people who were in this room, let's say, last week. So space and time are what give separateness. And all of our empirical experience is conditioned by time and space. That's Kant's first principle. However, we can have an intuitive experience that disregards time and space. And Schopenhauer uh, speaks of this in a very important paper that he uh, wrote some many years into the 19th century called The Foundations of Morality. And there he asks, how is it that a human being can so experience the pain 
and danger and peril of another, that forgetting his own self-protection, he moves spontaneously to the other's rescue, even at the risk of his own life. He doesn't do it out of duty. He doesn't do it out of uh, intention. It is suddenly his impulse to save that person. A child's about to be hit by a car. You go out and you get hit. This goes on all the time. Schopenhauer asks, how is it that the first law of nature, the maintenance and protection of this separate entity, can suddenly be dissolved and another principle take over? And he says, it's because you and that other are one. He said, this is a metaphysical realization. Primarily, separateness is secondary. And unity, identity, is the prime condition. There can be then another approach to this. And it's the approach of identifying yourself you know, the Hindus ask you, who am I? This is a big discipline. Am I this body? <clears throat> I was once giving a lecture to a group of prep school boys on uh, Buddhism. And how could I render this idea to them? Because what is called Buddha consciousness is the one consciousness of which we are all manifestations. We are all Buddha things. We are all separate manifestations of this great consciousness that informs the whole universe. The plants are conscious. The stones are conscious. All things are conscious. So I said to the boys, um, look up at the ceiling. You can say the lights, plural, are on. Or you can say the light is on. These are two ways of saying exactly the same thing. The lights are on is accenting the individual vehicle, the bulb. And the light is on is accenting the general light. But there are two ways of saying exactly the same thing. Now in, uh, in Japan, the accent on the individual thing is called the jihokai, or the individual realm. And the accent on the general is called the Rihokai, the general realm. And there's a little saying, Ji, Ri, Mu, Ge, individual, general, no obstruction, no difference. So, so when one light breaks, the superintendent of buildings and grounds doesn't come in and say, oh, I was particularly fond of that bulb. That was the important one. This is a calamity. He takes it out, puts another bulb in. What is important? It is the light, not the vehicle. And I said, now I look down at all your, your heads, and uh, of what are these the vehicles? They are the vehicles of consciousness. So which are you? Are you the head or are you the consciousness? With what do you identify yourself? With the vehicle or with what is carried? And if you can carry, uh, identify yourself with what is carried, namely consciousness, that's the consciousness that's in all the bulbs. And so you are identifying yourself with that which is the unifying principle. And that's what the person identified himself with who went to save another person spontaneously. These are two approaches to the realization that the separateness is secondary. And the separateness is a function of the experience within time and space. Now that's the basis of Kant's critique of pure reason, part one, transcendental aesthetic. And what he called the thing in itself, the ding on sich, is no thing. Because to be a thing, you have to be in time and space. So we're beyond all time and space. And that's our uh, true being. The question that Joseph Campbell is exploring here is a fundamental one. How can we know for sure, as what Kant called apodictic or self-evident knowledge, that what we perceive is in fact the truth? Kant's insight was that anything that we conceive of or perceive is already filtered by the very fact that we are thinking of it.
That is to say that reason is only capable of thinking in terms of what Kant calls categories of thought. Even the largest ideas, God, infinity, truth itself, are limited by the human mind's need to think in terms of discrete, concrete chunks. So, our idea of a thing is in fact only a subset of the thing itself, the Ding an sich. As Joe shows us, Kant's successors came to realize that the great teachers of the East had grappled with this problem millennia earlier. A group of philosophers, known as the Romantics, would find ways to integrate the metaphysical insights of the sages of India and East Asia into the Aristotelian tradition of the West. There's a marvelous little story that Daisetsu Suzuki, that uh, Zen philosopher, <coughs> uh, brought up in one of his talks about Zen. He tells of a young man who asked his guru, am I in possession of Buddha consciousness? And the guru said, uh, no. And he said, uh, well, I've heard that all things are in possession of Buddha consciousness, the stones, the trees, the flowers, the birds, the animals, all beings. Yes, said the master, you are correct. All things are in possession of Buddha consciousness, the stones, the flowers, the bees, the birds, but not you. <laughs> Why not me? Because you're asking this question. That's to say, instead of living in the knowledge that comes from that transcendent source. He's living in the knowledge of him himself as a separate unit. And um, that throws him off. So he isn't living out of his Buddha consciousness. Now the trick f for the artist is so to present his material that it doesn't put a ring around itself and stand there as separate from you, the observer. And that aha that you get when you see a uh, artwork that really hits you is, I am that. I am the very radiance and energy uh, that is talking to me through this thing. <clears throat> In purely empirical terms, it's called participation. But it's more than that. It's identification. <coughs> So that's the first thing. And Thomas Mann and Joyce are working on this all the way through. And we're going to try to find out something about how they do it and what the results were. Now there's a second part to Kant's critique of pure reason. And this is called the transcendental logic. And what uh, he points out there is that uh, the way we think is determined by our mind not by the way things are. All of the relationships of grammar and of logic are functions of the mind. So we experience these objects in time and space, and then we think about them in terms of the categories of logic. Whereas the true mystery is beyond logic, is beyond time and space. Now, beyond my logic means that all the words we ask, the questions we, we ask, have no relevance to the problem. The word God is uh, supposed to be a reference to the ultimate mystery. But the ultimate mystery is beyond all form, beyond all names, beyond oneness, beyond multitude, one and many. These are categories of thought. So you're not talking about anything. And one of the problems in our religious tradition is it deals with God as though God were a fact. Can't be a fact. We just don't have the words that open out into transcendence. The problem of these artists is to make everything open back into transcendence so that it doesn't glue you to itself. And when you think of God as a fact, you've lost the reference in the symbol. And this is why Meister Eckhart says, the great German mystic of the 13th and early 14th centuries, 
the ultimate leave taking is the leaving of God for God. You leave the folk idea that time and space determined image of God for the mystery which is out beyond all that. Now what we've got to find is, is how the artist, how Joyce, how Mann, particularly today Mann, has um, broken through and, and rendered this mystery. One way is through the rhythms of their prose. This is a problem of poetry. Uh, what the poet is doing is breaking you past the image, breaking you past the word so that things should point past themselves. Rhythm has a lot to do with this. Okay. Kant tells us all of our perceiving and thinking is conditioned by the a priori forms of our sensibility, time and space, and of our thinking. And he says the thing in itself, the Ding an sich, is beyond our experience. We look at each other, and, but this mystery, do we see the oneness? Schopenhauer comes along and says, yeah, but I am the Ding an sich. Of course I experience it. But I don't experience it this way. Am I in possession of Buddha consciousness? I am Buddha consciousness. Can you locate your mentality then so that it is in touch with this consciousness which antecedes mentality? <clears throat> now, the world is will and idea. I just want to give some main thoughts about that. Uh, because the, it informs the writing, totally informs the writing of Thomas Mann, and uh, informed the uh, operas of Wagner. It uh, informs Joyce, as we see. This is a very important philosopher. And he's put down by school philosophers because he's easy to read. <laughs> he's easy to read. Um, that's not... Cricket. Um, the, uh, the ideas that he got were extremely lucidly presented. Just at the time that Kant wrote his Critique of Pure Reason, Europe was beginning to learn about Oriental philosophy. There was a young Frenchman, Anquetil du Perron, who joined the French army in order to go to India to fight the British in the end of the 18th century, the Franco-British uh, uh, Wars and the British conquest of India. He, went, he wanted to go to India because he knew he could get some information there about Oriental philosophy. And uh, he actually published in Latin a Persian translation of some of the Upanishads. And this was called the Upne Kant. Schopenhauer read it and immediately realized that Oriental philosophy and the idea of Maya and Kantian metaphysics were identical. Now, it was Schopenhauer who was the first to bring Oriental terminology into Kantian thinking. So here, the beginning of the 19th century, 1818 or so, we have this synthesis of the two philosophies. And so it became possible for writers like Mann and Joyce to take in the whole enrichment of the Oriental understanding of transcendence and the Maya aspect of phenomenality, how it's all an illusion based on the mirror images of time and space. And render it in purely Occidental terms. This is a great, great moment. This comes in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, <coughs> uh, so, the world als Wille und Vorstellung. Wille, we might translate today energy, waves. <coughs> Vorstellung, 
idea isn't good. Object, image. The world as wave or energy and as image. In physics, when they found that subatomic particles could be interpreted as particles or as waves, they hit exactly the same thing. This is the nature of the world. And this is what's coming up in this hologram idea. A complex of waves seen through a certain kind of lens, you might say, becomes an image. A primum uses a very interesting analogy. We've all heard um, a radio and phonograph uh, sounds that come from two sources. Uh, the one source is here, the other is there, and yet the sound seems to be here. And we actually experience the object, namely the sound, where it isn't. Now, says Pribram, we're all that way. We all look as though we were here. This isn't where we are at all. We're these waves, you know, and looked at in a certain way, time and space, we have this, this secondary character. And so there are two ways of experiencing everything. You can interpret everything in terms of the visual relationships, cause and effect, or in terms of will. Now, the function of art, and Shakespeare was who said, art holds a mirror up to nature, art holds, you might say, a uh, holographic mirror up to nature, so that you can see that in this object is the totality. Each is a totality in itself, and this is the way these men deal with their characters. They are totals. They are not simply particles of a space field. They are, in some way or other, totals. Now, you know what has happened in our mechanistic sciences. Even the psyche is, inter is uh, interpreted simply in terms of cause and effect. Um, I respond because of a certain stimulus, stimulus response. I'm walking along the street, and I decide to go over there. Why did I decide to cross the street? Well, there was some display in a, um, in a window store window. So somebody asked me, uh, why did you cross the street? Well, the scientist would say, because that store window display caused him to do this. And I would answer, because I wanted to. Now, we can take any object and put it down on the table and, and give it a push. Why did that nickel move? Because I hit it with my finger. But if you were to ask the nickel, it would say, oh, I decided I'd go over there. The, these two ways, from inside <laughs> and from outside of, uh, of the experience. Now, I remember after one of my talks <laughs> in one college campus where I was talking about yoga and how the function of yoga is to unite waking consciousness to the source of consciousness. Now, in our thinking normally, we think of consciousness as being a product of the brain, but not, that's not the way the Orient thinks. The brain is a product of consciousness. It's a vehicle of, and uh, instrument of consciousness. Consciousness is what produces it. And I remember one professor asked me afterwards, what do you mean by consciousness? Well, he had the idea to all start up here. I said, well, I, I dare say you, you're speaking of consciousness as something that comes from the human brain, but I said, uh, it, it goes much deeper than that. <clears throat> For instance, would you, have you ever seen a polo game? He said, yes. Would you say that the horse was conscious of the game? Well, yes. How about a dog, a hunter's dog? Is he conscious of what the hell? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's get down to caterpillars, you know? <laughs> and how about uh, plants? Are they conscious of where the sun is? Is that why all they need? Well, he hadn't thought of it that way, and so I took a coin out of my pocket, and I said, I'll bet you this coin knows just where the ground is. <laughs> now, that's Schopenhauer. Uh, the, the will informs all of nature, all things, all things are Buddha things. And a manifestation of conscious on the purely physical level is gravity. On the plant level, 
it's heliotropism, the plants turning to the sun and so forth. There's a consciousness there. When I was a kid walking through the woods, I'd come every now and then, as anyone will, uh, to a barbed wire fence. And the barbed wire runs along and it leans right up against the tree and the tree will have enclosed that. It took it into account. You touch yourself and the white corpuscles come. You can interpret these mechanically or you can interpret them in terms of actual will. Schopenhauer's idea was that an ever-present energy, what he called the will, underlies and unifies all things, while the mind sees only division, that is, Kant's categories of thought. This view corresponds to the 3,000-year-old image from the Indian Vedas of the sleeping god Vishnu, who is dreaming the endless dream that is the universe, while four-faced Brahma, sitting on a lotus that grows from Vishnu's navel, creates the everyday, dualistic world of separate phenomena. And Schopenhauer, in another wonderful paper of his, The Will in Nature, speaks about evolution in almost Lamarckian terms as coming not simply from the Darwinian mechanistic way of explaining it, variation of species, uh, a vari a random variation, natural selection, and survival of the fittest. No, he says, the impulse is from inside. It is to differentiation, it is to expansion, it is to discovery, it is to development. <clears throat> now it's that whole idea of a will that is antecedent to our experience of things and uh, which can be experienced through things and that is the one will in all things. <clears throat> now uh, Schopenhauer uh, takes at least in certain way of inflecting all of this, uh, what seems to be a pessimistic negative attitude toward this. This one will in nature moves everything to eat everything else. The life lives by consuming life. And then there comes a time in uh, human consciousness when people, there are certain types of people who say, oh, that shouldn't be that way. So we start by being vegetarians. And uh, then uh, if we're Jains, we start by not eating at all. And, uh, and Schopenhauer says at one place, life is something <coughs> that should not have been. It's a mistake that everything should be eating everything else. That's taking the position of the, the object in the world. Not of the dynamic, it's the same nature that's eating itself through several figures. And when Nietzsche comes along then and reads Schopenhauer, he, one of his early papers was Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer as educator, absolutely given all the way to Schopenhauer, he takes the other attitude toward this eating it itself and he says, yes, this is not only as it is but as it should be, and it can't be otherwise. Now what this brings in is a terrific emphasis on what the tender-minded call violence. That's what nature is. Every now and then you see something that opens your mind to this. Last year, I think it was in May, <coughs> the May Geographic, or maybe it was two years ago, there was a picture that just lifted the hair on my head it was of a gazelle being eaten by three cheetahs. Cheetahs are kind of leopard. And you had this animal lying on the ground with three cheetahs eating its belly and the animal was alive and its head was lifted in a kind of plea for compassion or mercy. Can you say yay to that? You've got to. So the artist now has to disengage himself from the ethical, phenomenal way of thinking and put himself in the position of this dynamic of the will and at the same time not lose his time-space position, his ethical position. 
there is a conflict between ethics and metaphysics that runs right through the whole problem of art. And as soon as an artist begins to let the ethical dominate over the metaphysical insight, his work becomes cliché, it becomes cerebral, he's lost the energy, and it goes. You can have a propaganda art, you know, social realism and all that kind of garbage, but uh, that has nothing to do with the breakthrough of art. And this is a problem that struck Mann and struck Joyce. And for Mann, it became quite crucial when Hitler came into Germany. He lost his aesthetic double vision, and his work declined. <clears throat> and that took place between volumes three and four of the Joseph novels in the 40s. Total transformation, Mann. <clears throat> so now to get uh, closer to Mann, I'm trying to give the Kantian idea of the phenomenality in time and space. The will in nature, as Schopenhauer stresses it, and the one will, the one consciousness in all things. And then the ambiguity that comes out of that as a result. Two positions. Enthusiasm about the one that moves through all things, and special care and concern for the individual thing that is being destroyed by this. One of Nietzsche's very early works, and is one of the great works of the 19th century, is The Birth of Tragedy. And uh, this is a work that tremendously influenced Mann, even deeper than Mann knew, as you'll see in a little while. What he points out there is that in the Greek tragedy, the two aspects are brought to a beautiful balance. The aspect of concern for the individual entity, what Nietzsche called the principium individuationis, the individuating principle, and the energy of the will, which brings forth and destroys all things. The energy of the will is represented in the god Dionysos, and the concern for the individual entity is what's represented in the, what might I say, radiance of the god Apollo. And Nietzsche shows in the world, in, in the um, birth of tragedy, how in Greek tragedy these two principles are perfectly united. There is concern for the individual, but there is the rapture that comes when, through the individual's dissolution, you have ex experienced the power of the will, which is your own dynamic and all. It's a beautiful thing. Now, in Thomas Mann's writing, the accent on rhythm and music, the musicality of his prose, which you just don't get in translation, but which in his uh, German is uh, firm and exquisite, with that, you have the Dionysian principle. And then his precision in attention to details. His writing is plastic. With that, you have accent on the Apollonian principle. And then in Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, he asks this question. Why is it that when Socrates' mind comes along, asking philosophical questions from the standpoint of rational consciousness, the art of the tragedy declines. Its great strength is in Aeschylus. Its last sort of cliché stage is in Euripides. And uh, why is it that the philosophical mind always turns the dynamic of nature into a problem? <laughs> Here comes philosophy as the critic of nature. The world shouldn't be the way it is. This is the mental overtaking the dynamic of the will. 
So Schopenhauer asked, uh, need to ask this question, why is it that when the philosopher comes in, uh, like Socrates, um, art goes out? Socrates had a muse that came to him one day and said, Socrates, learn to sing, practice music. And so Nietzsche came up with the ideal, the rescue would be the music singing Socrates. And this was Thomas Mann's ideal for his own art. You have the Dionysian principle in the wonderful poetry of his prose, the rhythms, the sounds, choices of words that would carry past just the verbal reference. You have the Apollonian in the attention to the temporal and spatial image and separate entity with great attention. And finally, that explication that comes along always, telling you the meaning, not criticizing it, but affirming it. The mind that doesn't take nature apart, but the mind that celebrates it. Now I might just say that in general, that is the principal difference between Western and Eastern philosophy. In the West, in general, the mental slant turned criticism onto nature. You have a critical analytical, but the Oriental philosophers interpreted nature, interpreted myth, explicated it without criticizing it. And so when Schopenhauer brings the Oriental into the Occidental, he brings that explication, <coughs> attitude rather than uh, criticism, and Nietzsche then gives a new push to it with his total <coughs> affirmation of everything in the world. Nietzsche's wonderful word, Amor fati, love of fate. He says, if you criticize or wish to change one detail of your life, you've unraveled the whole thing. <coughs> your life is such a net. And I, I know that this is a very important uh, pedagogical um, suggestion. Say yes to it, to your mistakes, to everything that goes to pieces. When a calamity comes, uh, that is the period of dissolution out of which recreation will come. But the recreation has to find what was faulty in the position that then dissolved and what now carries me past that. And it's a, out of destruction comes creation. This is the Dionysian principle, affirmation of the pain, of the anguish, of the fact that nature tears itself apart. Now this gives a kind of, for our rather tender-minded attitude that has been cultivated particularly recently, uh, this gives a kind of chill to us when we read what is actually implied in the art of these men. They're talking about the dynamic of things as they are, not as they should be. And then the quality of pity and compassion, mitleid, suffering with, comes in. <clears throat> in South America, in the Inca and pre-Inca mythologies of South America, there's an image of a deity who is shown with tears streaming down from his eyes. Those tears are the fertilizing rain that uh, bring forth life. But when life is brought forth, then all the pain of life is brought forth too, so there are tears of compassion as well. That's the ambiguity of this whole thing. It's a wonderful image. The God weeping, whose very tears are creating the world of pain and suffering. Uh, mm -hmm. And you're not going to get rid of pain and suffering because that's the very essence of time. And so we come to the Buddha idea, all life is sorrowful. It is. And what is the escape from sorrow in nirvana, which is getting past the desire that it should be this way or the fear that it might be that way to the immovable point. And that immovable point, as we'll be seeing a little later, is the point of arc. There's something rather 
what can I say, exhilarating about putting yourself on the side of life instead of on the side of protective ideas. When all these protective ideas about life that you've been holding break down and you realize what a horrific thing it is and you are it. This is the rapture of the Greek tragedy. This is what Aristotle calls catharsis. Catharsis is a ritual term and it is elimination of the ego perspective. Wiping out ego system, wiping out rational structuring, smashing it and let the life boom come through. The Dionysian thing smashes the whole business. And so you are purged of your ego judgment system by which you're living all the time. Now, there's new notions of consciousness that are beginning to come in now in this uh, holographic uh, paradigm idea. Uh, we are all in our consciousness one. And we're one with the totality. And potentially omniscient, actually omniscient, but the brain brings us to focus here so that we can live in this particular time and space. So the brain is a constrictor. It's a contractor of our knowledge. We know all these facts that help us here. Then what happens with, what happened when the brain was blown, let's say with LSD or something like that is, wow! And you may ne never get your brain back. We've got to live in terms of the here, now affirmation of this particular focus, but with the knowledge of other foci, other possibilities, and the whole totality range, in order to work as artists in the sense of these people I'm talking about this weekend. You're in, in, in a field of deep problem. Why should these men have given their whole lives to working on problems like this if they weren't of, you know, life-shattering depth. Is the problem of the relationship of art to life? Is it a killer of life or is it a fosterer of life? It's a fosterer of life. These are powerful ideas, powerfully stated. The philosophies of Schopenhauer and Nietzsche radically altered the way in which Western culture viewed such basic concepts as good and evil, the world of phenomena, and the self. While such ideas may seem abstract, it's worth noting that it was through a willful misreading of their work that the Nazis justified some of their most awful and devastating acts. At the same time, the works of the Romantic philosophers would provide an enormous inspiration up to the present day, not only to new generations of thinkers, but to some of the greatest artists of the past century. In the next program, Joe will explore how these ideas would influence the myth-making work of authors such as T.S. Eliot, James Joyce, and in particular, Thomas Mann.